Uh, thank you for this invitation. And what I'm going to really do is extend some of what Alejandro has presented and use the rubric of urban design because I think it's important that we also frame what might be bridge practices in delivering exactly the challenges uh, that Alejandro has sort of outlined. And I think what is critical is the question of synthesis because these are the multiple forces that we are trying to bring together. Uh, democracy, and we've talked about this, advanced capitalism, neoliberal policies, is a fatal combination for urban form of cities and more generally uh, for urban design as we imagine it today as a practice, a practice that aspires to create both coherence and efficiencies in the way urban form is imagined in our cities. However, today the reality of operating uh, in an environment where most decisions are made or determined by market forces, Alejandro had patient capital, but this is really the architecture of impatient capital, uh, it's sort of contradictory to what urban design aspires to do as a bridge practice, once that one that implies flows and is open, a practice that's plastic and reconfigures itself, depending on the problem and the agents actors, constituencies, it has to influence plastic enough to even configure and reconfigure itself between build form and the broader ecologies of the natural systems in which it is situated. So how, do, how does one bring that sort of question in? And more critically, as the bridge discipline that embraces the autonomy of architecture and the rich terrain of the social sciences that ideally inform the disciplines of urban planning. Now starting in the mid 80s, when governments around the world were unleashing privatized of city development, architecture at scale came to be understood as urban design. Battery Park City that you see here and the likes were models of best practices, Canary Wharf uh, in London. Of course, a public sector was involved, but these generally landed up being uh, sort of large scale uh, architecture. Now, Interestingly, this model is now exported extremely rapidly from the North American and the metropolitan European landscapes of deep democracy to landscapes of severe auto autocracy like China, Middle East, and many other locations around the world. Naturally, this has caused urban design to be understood as a large-scale architectural project deployed at the urban scale, or architecture as an autonomous object with little relation uh, to the urban, in, in, sen in a sense. And the reality is the world of the informal. I mean, look at India here. In Indian cities, 90% of the economy is informal. And of course, this sets up a whole different, because it reverses urbanization. And this is a diagram by Joan Buskitz, who's a colleague of mine, where he says, shows us how from the traditional city, where you had urbanization, plot division, and building, in the informal city, it's exactly the opposite. You have built form first, then plot division and urbanization, if you legalize it, so to speak, or try to integrate it. So there's a complete reversal even in the protocols and processes uh, of the building of cities. Now, I think this sense of dis disengagement with reality has attracted criticism of what urban design has come to mean and its obsession with the built form in a narrow sense without the dimensions of the social. Today, there seems to be a growing consensus within the profession of architecture and planning to supplement the rubric of urban design, and this is very much out of the American Academy because in Europe it was natural where we are trying to supplement urban design with this broader urbanism. Now, the many forms of reading and engaging with with urbanism that have emerged in the discourse today really serve as a critique, I believe, of the unrealized potential of urban design to engage in more substantial ways in placemaking and how to intersect with the social and the more natural ecologies we operate in. However, the use of urbanism implies a passive field of study, observational. The dictionary defines it as a study of cities or city life depending on the context it is used. Urban design with the prefix of design to to urban, I think, makes it much more pointed to design. It makes it more operational versus observational of, of the urban. Now, these critiques of urban design, whether it's new urbanism or landscape urbanism, are projected or represented as an absolute position, often without any specificity or at least the aspirations to become absolute positions. Instead, I think urban design as a bridge practice or discipline is intrinsically counter position to the perpetuation of the absolute. And I think this is very important for us to imagine imagine the city crisis as we are discussing. In fact, this is the robustness of urban design as a category where without being an absolute, it has sufficient specificity to operate on the ground through its negotiations with the discipline of architecture and planning. In that sense, it's a practice that operates across scales, from piece of street furniture to larger scale territorial operations, but with a humble 
approach to grounded realities. And we saw Medellin, we saw the examples in Paris. I mean, they're just many examples, the work Alejandro showed us, the work we are going to see. Design advocacy is an integral part of the practice of urban design. In fact, urban design is about activism, about drawing the disciplines of architecture, landscape, and planning closer together as being a conduit for critical feedback loops on which the survival and improvements of our cities and broader landscapes depend. Today, with new technology that can be appropriated for this purpose, uh, the, these processes, these feedback loops can be deployed in far more complex ways and actually give urban design as a practice a much sharper advocacy edge, which I think is really lacking. This would really make urban designers uh, kind of contemporary practicing polymath, one who directs dialogues, dialogue-based processes for in imagining spatial possibilities means directing movement, lifestyle, morals, and the interaction of individuals, thus rendering urban design highly influential in the imagination and construction of the built environment. Thus, the definition of urban design, besides its activism dimension of closing feedback loops between planning and architecture, and that is necessarily an uh, that it also is very human-centric, a field of constant co contestation where social resolution is manifest by the resolution of spatial imaginations coupled with the design process. So I think that sort of is my framing of the crisis within the definition of urban design. And I think going into the future, one of the issues that will be critical for urban design is to grapple in the coming decades with the question and the role of temporal landscapes in the imagination of our cities. The argument is clearly not to pose this as another form of urbanism, but to argue of its inherent values in supplementing the dynamics of the static city, but also a phenomena that's part of an expanded field of understanding the current state of urbanism globally. Basically, to identify it as not to identify it as just one more form of urbanism, but a strain of urban readings and practices that could be instrumental for both practitioners as well as for the reflection of urban design on the ground. And this argument is really uh, uh, of the temporal is further propelled by two critical phenomena. The first is the, the massive sort of uh, scale of the informalization of our city where urban space is configured outside the formal preview of the state. And secondly, the massive shifts uh, in demography uh, that is occurring uh, and that will be accelerated through climate change the deletion, the imbalances, the inequities, the rise of natural disasters, etc. But largely, this flux is emanating from and will continue to accelerate given the sense of inequity, as Alejandro talked about. And you know, the European crisis is bringing it to the fore, but this migration and movement has occurred. I mean, look at between Mexico, Mexico and the United States, just look at between India and the Middle East and the conditions that people live in. We are recognizing it in the context of Europe because it's becoming a startlingly different condition in terms of the adjacencies it's posing. But this is a phenomena that has occurred, but design hasn't paid it uh, any attention. And this is a diagram that's called the five stages of squatting, which is the incrementality with which cities are made uh, in places like India and many parts of South Asia. I, I want to sort of it, it also, at a larger scale, poses much broader questions. If you just look at India and what is urban in India, it's very interesting. In India, the government uses three criteria to define what a town is. One is a population of over 5,000 people. I think Mexico uses 2,000 people, a density of 400 persons per square kilometer. And interestingly, that 75% of the population should be in non-agricultural employment. So it's interesting, if you look at that, you see the map on your uh, on, your, on your left, or depending, yeah, on your left, uh, that's what the map will show us, but if you pixelate it down to just the criteria of 5,000 people, uh, look at the kind of pattern of urbanization. But if you look at density, you begin to get one big city along the northeast from east, from west to east of India. So that becomes a large metropolitan area. But if you look at the 75% of people in urban agriculture as a criteria, very little is really urban. Or you could argue that India is 60 percent urban for six months of the year and 40 percent urban for the other six months, which is an interesting question because it leads us to the question of what flux means. And I think the big challenge for design and for urban design as we go on, and I think this resonates even in what Alejandro showed us at the scale of the half house, 
is that we are designing for absolutes. We have to address the question of design for transitions. How do we make these transitions? Environmentalists, energy experts do that. India is making a jump from fossil fuels to alternate energies, but it's making the transition through nuclear, which is a completely different direction. Now, whether we get caught in nuclear is another question, but sometimes transitions are not obvious. They're non-linear. And how do we design for transitions in making this jump, I think, is a very critical question. And so we've been using this rubric of ephemeral urbanism as a way of embedding a discourse within our normal business as usual discourses on urbanism to see what, how we could deal with this flux through what is temporary in nature. And we're using the rubric of ephemeral urbanism. We've created this taxonomy of transaction, religion, strife, extraction, celebration, refuge, and military. And the critical thing is how do you begin to embed time into this equation of planning? We don't have a way of articulating the notion of time and planning, and that is critical for transitions. So, of course, these are broken down by buildings, by landscapes, by waterways, because these rhythms are different. I don't know the answer, but these become some of uh, the very important challenges. And this project, which Alejandro alluded to, the Kum Mela, which is called Mapping the Ephemeral Mega City, because this is a city built every 12 years for 7 million people to live there and 100 million people to visit. Uh, and it's on the banks of the Ganges and the Yamuna. Uh, when the river dries up after the monsoon, uh, on the banks, this entire uh, city is built. It's on sand, it has no foundations, it's the lightest city that is built ever in the world, and it's the largest gathering of human beings on the planet. Uh, and that's a scale to Manhattan, uh, and probably has twice the density, even though it's just sort of low rise. That's a before and after image, uh, which I took in a late October, and the first week of January, that's what you saw from the same spot. Uh, the city emerges on these sand banks. It's a grid, which we've been discussing all day yesterday, but it takes care of a shifting context, which is the riverbed. Uh, and it's very robust because every road in the grid goes across as a bridge. So it's the most robust grid in the world because the river is negotiated uh, through a bridge uh, for every road. And that's what it's sort of how it pans itself out. Uh, in, and, and the interesting thing is the entire city for 7 million people is built out of these five materials. And that's why it's deployed so quickly. The five materials go up in scale uh, from the smallest hut, eight foot bamboo, uh, to large temples that are built there as community centers centers uh, that are then clad in cloth and become incredible spaces, all for these 55 days, very reversible, uh, and, 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 and at different scales for different functions with great diversity because within the grid, it's self-organized. It's very interesting that here, even the governance structure it's temporal in nature, uh, because we talk about temporality as an aesthetic question, something that looks temporary. But here you have a governance structure that for the first year works with this kind of hierarchy. It shifts to administrators in the next six months, and then it shifts on the ground to administrators on the ground. So it's a complete shift in the hierarchy with very little reporting between the two, and this group can go outside the circle. So it's a temporal governance structure which shifts uh, with, of course, linkages in, in reporting, and the guy here then has only two people he reports to so he can be very efficient and so there's a whole flip in the governance structure so temporality also occurs at that sort of level and after the you know the festival is over the rivers flood again and the city sort of takes over and it's left as a memory. I only put this as, a, as an example of extreme urbanism which takes care of this notion of flux. And to conclude in a minute, one could argue that the future of cities depends less on the rearrangement of buildings and infrastructure and more on the ability for us to openly imagine more malleable technological, material, social, and economic landscapes. From these settlements, we can learn how to move towards an urbanism that recognizes and better handles the temporary and elastic nature of contemporary and emergent built environments with more effective strategies for managing change as an essential element for the construction of the urban environment. The challenge is then learning from extreme conditions on how to manage and negotiate different layers of the urban while accommodating emergent needs and often large neglected parts of urban society. Thus, the aspiration would be to imagine a more flexible practice of urban design more aligned with the emergent realities, enabling us to deal with more complex scenarios than those of static or stable consolidated situations. Then urban design is about how these spatial possibilities play out to influence the quality of lives of our economies, society, evolving culture, and the broader well-being of the planet. 
It is in the broader view of planetary implications and ecological thinking that will prepare us for questions of equity and humanism in the context of our operation. And finally, the choice for urban design and for a lot of design and planning is between being the thermometer or the thermostat, one that registers and the other that sets the temperature. While we need both finally, it's the instrumentality of design, what Alejandro referred to as a synthetic quality, one that is socially engaged, elastic in its intellectual configuration and practice is what will be relevant for the future. Thank you very much. So, Ro Ro, the, does it, most of the projects or initiatives or pieces of urbanism that you show with a sort of fondness, with an excitement, are probably not designed by urban designers. Or architects. Or architects. <laughs> right? So, is there a message there that actually both the way we think about the profession, and I think you made that very clearly, uh, and is there something about education which we may want to take up yes. in, in a moment, where basically urban design and urban designers have failed. Yeah. Uh, because in a way, we, if we take your words and we take the images of what most of us in this room think an urban designer does, we think of something fixed with bollards, badly designed, you know, not elegant, but you know, it's, it's got all the infrastructure in place, but it has no soul. But that, that's what we think of urban design. And in a way, you're saying that's one of, is that where you're taking us? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm arguing sort of in response to that two questions. One is that, yes, urban design is this bridge practice which creates these feedback loops. Therefore, it has the ability to understand protocols and processes and the implications that has on the built environment. And the other is, which I think has an implication on education, is that I think in our professions for too long, we've taken permanence as a default condition. Uh, our solutions are imagined with permanence. I mean, imagine if someone came to you and said, design a city for seven million people, a mega city, uh, for 55 days. We won't really know how to start. Now, education won't prepare us anyway. Yes. I would like to ask you uh, as follows. Uh, you spoke about this festival, uh, your festival. Yeah. Could you imagine that this festival is also produced in Milano, Berlin, Barcelona? Well, you know, I mean, I, well, of course, this Sorry, is... Sorry, the question. No, no, I, 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 you know, it's a really relevant question. I brought this up yesterday. I think one of the things we have to be careful about, which, which is a trap we easily fall into discourses like this, is the idea of universalizing these. So yes. I think you have to abstract it more to see what yes. you might learn from it. So I don't think it's a question of replicability, but for me, I think one of the most exciting things about what we learned was the governance structure flips around like that. That's interesting because we take, okay. uh, besides our cities, we take governance as a very fixed permanent. We look at continuity in incredibly limited ways in some ways, but the fact that you could have this move around on a temporal scale, I think op challenges to think about other models. I'm not saying we replicate that, but I mean, I think that suddenly opens up a question, takes us away from the limitation of aesthetics and temporality that we as designers seem to correlate, you know? And so, well, I'll give you a simple example. I quote this very often. My friend Mark Angeli from the ETH told me about this wonderful experience he had when he took 10 students or 15 students to Ethiopia to study an informal settlement. And they, they showed up there and uh, they had a week and they did six days of intense mapping, measure drawing, photography, and they kept the last. discussions, we, we have an aesthetic baggage, uh, we connect to it, um, you know, which is about temporary materials and all of that. So, I mean, I think this decoupling of protocols and aesthetics is, again, a challenge for the profession. And does this issue of, you know, good design doesn't actually embed in it at the moment, if you add the value aspect of your triangle, so to speak, doesn't actually accept temporality. You want to invest for the longer term. Is it, I mean, is that, I mean, you, you broke that rule with your half a house, but yeah, the problem is that the kind of, of challenges that we're facing won't be answered if we deal with inpatient capital. And people want to, using the built environment for having a profit as much as possible in the shortest possible period of time. We won't get there. The only way to address that is it, if we can 
appeal to patient capital that is looking for predictability. What does the architect, the designer, need to do to appeal to that? Okay, in order to guarantee the long-term quality of the built environment so that individual interventions gain value over time, there's a few things you need to guarantee. And in that sense, the scarcity resource, of course, is not money, but coordination. Uh, synthesis on one hand, coordination. The quality, the footprint of the void, and I, I really think the more footprint of the void, what is that? Well, it seems this is a more or less uh, architect's environment. I, I would frame it like, get the nolly right. If the, the nolly of the future city... The space in between buildings. Yes. Gian Battista yeah. nolly, mapping, yeah, what's yeah. built, what's not built for taxes. That's what the main uh, yeah. issue. So get if you right. get the nolly right, and particularly the white part, what is not built, then eventually you can allow for that private initiative, be it an investment or be the person just, just providing themselves with the built environment to gain value over time. And that's why there are a few, I don't know if it's rules, but at least some clues in the proportion, in the width, in Absolutely. the quality. That is, it's, uh, it's not rocket science, it's, it's a rather simple thing to achieve, so but it's, it's an open system. It's more than synthesis. It's, what? it's great. I mean, you're talking about proportion. Oh, sorry, I'm saying it's more than synthesis. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, Closer yeah, to the mic. Yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, it's also a matter of both because, uh, I, I mean, I think this is, at least my argument is not about the fact we should be making temporary cities, but we should be inspired by maybe just the protocols of these. I think the half house is a good example of exactly this, where it, it's helping making a transition uh, to another economy, but keeping it open-ended, uh, at least for 50% of the space. So, I mean, I think the lessons that one can draw out of this are at many levels, and therefore we, we mustn't be obsessed by the aesthetic implication only. 